You know, a man called C. True founded a franchise in 1946. And he decided that on Sundays, I will give all my employees off so that they may rest because they have been working 24 hours every day of the week. I want them to rest and then to go worship, those who want to go worship. And that was in 1946. That was the founder of Chick-fil-A. And since that 1946, it's been so. Every Sunday, no Chick-fil-A is open. And now in New York, they are proposing a bill that says there's a particular highway in New York, and that that highway, the rest stops there. When drivers are driving and they want to rest and buy something, every restaurant or uh, drive-by f- food chain that is there must open on Sunday. So that bill is tailored and it was to target Chick-fil-A because they are the only ones that don't open on Sundays. And, of course, some people in Congress are trying to fight it, that they're not going to allow it to stand. But this is where I'm going. Why? Now, they say that it is because they want everybody who likes chicken to have access to chicken when they are traveling. And it's a waste of space to give it to a franchise that will not open on Sunday. Now, but you and I know that if that franchise had said, we are not opening, since 1946, that we are not opening on Sunday to honor Martin Luther King Jr. Or to honor some icon of Native American or Native Indian. Nobody is going to say anything. The only reason is because of Christ. That name, Christ, there is something about that name. You ask yourself, why? Why are you targeting that name? The whole Congress, you are making a bill to just target that name. In Iowa, just, just last week, a city in Iowa, someone went there, the, set, the head of the Satanist Club, went there and built a statue right beside the nativity scene with a goat head, with blood, and all kind of sacrifices right beside the nativity scene. And so, someone saw it in another state. One man saw it in another state, and he was outraged. He traveled all the way to Iowa and decapitated the head of that thing and scattered it and put everything in a basket and in a trash and trashed it. And then he went and reported himself (laughs) to the police there on the ground that this is what I did. So they smiled, they gave him a citation, charged him for some misdemeanor, and they let him go. But you ask yourself, why? If you're a Satanist and you want to recognize a day or honor Satan, choose another day, do your own thing. Nobody, nobody worries about that. Get your group of people, build as many Satan statues as you want. Pour as much blood as you want. Why on Christmas season? Why Christmas season? Why near the nativity scene? What are you trying to do? There is something about that name. Why do you want to cancel it? Why do you want to cancel Christmas? Why do you want to desecrate Christmas? Why do you want to negate Christmas? Why do you want to counterbalance or countervail Christmas? Why do you want to abort it or abolish it or annul it? Why? This year, some of you will remember, at the Dodgers Stadium, some trans and the queer organization, they call themselves the Perpetual, Ladies for Perpetual, Sisters for Perpetual Indulgence. And they were dressed as nuns, and one of them was put on the cross, and the other was simulating all manner of sexual perversions on the one on that cross. Now, the Catholic Church was outraged, and they mobilized all of their Catholics in L.A. to go and ambush and besiege the Dutch Stadium so that nobody would be able to go in. 
And so when the baseball team that was honoring this organization were going to play, the place was empty. Nobody was there to cheer them because they had blocked the whole place so that nobody would enter. The Catholics were outraged. And you ask yourself, why? Why, why are you using the cross for such sexual perversion? What is it about this Jesus? What is it about this Christ? What is it about this cross that gives everybody trouble and people don't like it? They don't like the Christmas. They don't want to hear it. They want to negate it. They want to annul it. They want to eliminate it. They want to ax it and nix it. Why? You ask yourself, why? That must be a reason. That must be, re- and there is a reason. That's a reason why I'm, I'm going there. Several years, as you know, here in America, they have shifted from Merry Christmas to Happy Holidays. Why? Why? There's a reason. Why the shift from Merry Christmas to Happy Holidays? Why do you remove the Christmas and move it and change to holidays and say it's Happy Holidays for everybody? Why? I want to read something to you from the Wikipedia. Listen very closely to what I'm reading. I will point some things out. It's to, it, it, this passage is talking about in Wikipedia, it's talking about the historical Jesus. Now, nobody disputes the fact that Jesus, a historical Jesus walked the face of the earth. Nobody disputes it. But listen to how Wikipedia puts something. Listen very carefully. It says about Jesus Christ of Nazareth. He says, he was arrested in Jerusalem and tried by the Jewish authorities, which is true. The, the Wikipedia is making categorical statements. Things, statements of facts, that thing that happened. They said he was there giving people information that there was a Jesus Christ of Nazareth who was arrested in Jerusalem, who was tried by the Jewish authorities, that he was turned over to the Roman government. These are facts. So they were recording facts. And they said, and was crucified on the order of Pontius Pilate. In other words, they are saying these things happened. It's history. Nobody's disputing it. Wikipedia acknowledges it, that this is history, that it happened. Okay? Pontius Pilate, the Roman prefect of Judea, after his death, Wikipedia acknowledges his death, that there was a man called Judah, called Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified, and he died. Now listen to this. After his death, his followers believed he rose from the dead. Why didn't they say he rose from the dead? Just as they have been saying every single statement, categorically. Why did they say to his followers believed that he rose from the dead? Why? Because they don't agree. They don't want anybody to say that he rose from the dead. It is his followers who believe it. Even though till today, Wikipedia and those who wrote it, they have not been able to find the body of Jesus. Because he rose from the dead. Till today, they have not been able to explain why his tomb was empty. Till today, they have not been able to explain why the Jewish authorities went to Pilate and begged him to please tell the soldiers to say that the disciples came to steal his body. Till today, we know where Muhammad was buried. We know where the, all the prophets of the other religions, where they were buried. Nobody knows where the body of Jesus is. Why? Because he rose. Now, Ron Reagan Jr. is the president of freedom from religion. You want to be free from religion. Say freedom from religion. He says something. Listen to what he said. He said, he is not afraid to burn in hell for all eternity. What kind of demon will drive someone to make a statement? What kind of hatred can you have for this Christ and this thing about judgment and eternity and for Christmas and what it represents that will make you to be so furious and to, be, and to put a curse on yourself that you will born in hell and you are not afraid to burn in hell for all eternity? What is that thing about this name? That is generating the, the, is this intense hate, this intense anger about Christmas and about Christ. 
What is it? Well, all these things, they didn't start today. They did back to a time when the real ash enemy of Christmas was reigning in Judea. Read with me. Put on the screen. Matthew chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 1. Now, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem. Notice that I didn't say three wise men. Okay, so when you see all those pictures of three old men, that's not what the Bible is, not three. It just say wise men. We don't know their number. Okay? Saying, where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. When Herod the king heard, had heard these things, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him, in Bethlehem of Judea. For thus it is written by the prophet, and thou Bethlehem in the land of Judah at not the least among the princes of Judah for out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel then Herod when he had privily called the wise men inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared and he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child. And when ye have found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. When they had heard the king, they departed. And lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. And when they, now saw, when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they were coming to the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. Jump to verse 16. Verse 16. Now listen to this. That's why this is the arch enemy of Christmas. Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceeding wrath. He was livid. He was angry. And sent forth and slew or killed, massacred the children that were in Bethlehem and in all the coast thereof from two years old and under just in case he didn't want to miss him he didn't want to risk missing him they say he calculated it according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. He calculated when they came, how many months and years passed. So he, he, he cushioned it here, cushioned the beginning, cushioned the end, and knows that there is no way this boy can escape. This boy can escape from this. So kill everybody two years and under. That was how it started. The spirit of Herod. Why? Because he was thinking, this Jesus, this king, he has come to be a king. His kingdom is of this world. He's going to take away my power. He's going to up upend the whole empire of Rome. He's going to cause havoc here. We are going to lose our position. We are going to lose our kingship. We are going to lose everything. This guy, and then he's probably going to judge us. If he's going to be this powerful, the way they are saying it, we are going to come under his judgment. Only God knows what he will do with us. I must kill him. I must eliminate him. There must be no Christmas. No Christ is going to be born. We will kill him. As soon as he's born, he's dead. I want to share with you very quickly. Christmas. Fragrance of life or stench of death. Christmas. Is this the fragrance of life to you and to all those who are watching us online? Or is it a stench of death? Or doom. It's going to be either. That's what Christmas is. All those examples I gave you, those who are trying to abort it and eliminate it and negate it, for them, Christmas is a stench of doom. It's a stench of death. For those who are celebrating Christmas and rejoicing about the birth of Christ, for them, it's a fragrance of life to life. And I'm going to share with you why in the next couple of minutes. 
2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, the Philippians version says, Thanks be to God who leads us wherever we are on his own triumphant way and makes our knowledge of him spread throughout the world like a lovely perfume. We Christians have the unmistakable saint of Christ, discernible alike to those who have been saved and to those who are he heading for death. To the latter, those who are heading for death, it seems like the very smell of doom. It's a stench of death. To the former, it has a fresh fragrance of life itself. What is Paul saying? Paul is saying, Paul was painting the picture. He was given an imagery, painting the portrait of what normally happened when the Roman generals, when they have won a war, they will get all their captives and they will line them up and they will parade them on the streets and they will make them to be scattering fragrance, sweet smelly fragrance, and they were parading them throughout the city and the fragrance will be bringing fresh, great smell and fresh fragrance to the people. Paul is saying that is how Jesus Christ has captured us, has captured his own people. He has captured us, captured us with his love, captured us with his mercy, captured us with his grace, captured us with his loving kindness, and now he's parading us as trophies. And we, whenever we celebrate Christmas, whenever we talk about the peace that Jesus brings, whenever we talk about the love of Jesus, whenever we talk about the kindness and the loving kindness and the forgiveness of Jesus, whenever we talk about the power and about the grace of Jesus, we are like those captives that are throwing fragrance that is bringing smell, freshness, fragrance, perfume. That's the picture Paul was painting. You see, that is how it is with us anytime we talk about Christmas. So, this is what Christmas is. The celebration of Christmas, for me, when I've looked at all these things, I've made this conclusion. That this celebration of Christmas is an annual, global, it's it's celebrated everywhere in the world. The the Christmas is celebrated, Christmas season is not all over the world. It's an annual, global, deafening, in the sense that you can you hear Christmas songs everywhere on the channels of your radio, on TV, you are walking the streets, somebody is playing it, they are having Christmas concert, they are having carol service here and there, people are humming it on the street. It's a deafening sound, it's everywhere, inescapable. You can't escape it. Even on the airplane, they will be greeting you Merry Christmas. Some people will wear Christmas costume. The announcer will say Merry Christmas on the phone, on the on the on the, on the, on the the, uh, uh, what, is that thing, what is that thing called? On the, um, what, what is the name of this thing? That, that, uh, on the intercom. Thank you. They will be sitting on the intercom and everybody will hear Merry Christmas. You are on the cruise. The same thing. They will, you will be here. You can't escape. When it's Christmas time, there is nowhere you are in the world that you can escape it. You will know that there is Christmas. It's, uh, it's inescapable. Jolting. It jolts people out of they are complacency and what they have forgotten about Christ and what he represents. People have forgotten about Christ and what Christ represents. But when it's Christmas time and you begin to hear the story of Christmas, you begin to hear all the sermons of Christmas, you begin to hear illustrations about Christmas, it jolts you out of your complacency. And it reminds you that, wait a minute, wait a minute, I need to get my life together. This Jesus that they are talking about, which is what he stands for, this is what he represents. However... It also burns and scotches the consciences of those who are repentant. Those who don't want Christmas, those who are repentant, Christmas scotches and burns their hearts. They can't handle it. And I'm going to tell you why. Number one, Christmas reminds us of Emmanuel, God is with us. Because God is with us, it has two major implications for people. And that is why some, to some, hearing about Christmas, celebrating Christmas, is a stench of doom. One, God with us presupposes that there is a God. People don't like that. Because this God By saying that you are celebrating Christmas, he is not just a God like other gods. By saying that you are celebrating Christ, 
through Christmas, you are saying that he is the father of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is a problem right there. Big one. Because the way the world says, all roads lead to Rome. There are many gods. We just call them by different names. But you, you are saying when you are celebrating Christmas and you are throwing those fragrance that is bringing fresh fragrance to people and you are rejoicing and for you, it's a fragrance from life to life. For them, it's not. For them, it is a stench of doom and death because you are saying that no, all roads don't lead to Rome. There is a father of the Lord Jesus Christ. This baby that is born today, he has a father. He is called the father of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that carries implications because the Bible says that this father of the Lord Jesus Christ, unlike all other gods, he creates all, he created all the other gods and that he's omniscient. Omniscient means he knows everything about everything, which means even before you think a bad thought, he already knows it. People don't like that. It's a stench of doom for them. Not just that he knows what they think. No, no, no. Before you think it, he already knows what you're going to think. <laughs> People don't like it. It's a stench of death. It's a stench of doom for them. For those of us who celebrate Christmas, we are happy. We are happy because we know that, Lord, you know my thoughts. Please help me to think what is right. Forgive me when I think what is not right. For us, we know it's a forgiving God. It's a fragrance of life to life. We repent. We rejoice that he knows our thoughts. We know that he wants our thoughts to be like his thoughts. And when our thoughts contradict his thoughts, we repent. We say, sorry, Lord, please fill me with your thoughts. For us, it is life to life. For them, they are repentant. They don't want the thoughts of God. And so it's a stench of doom. Not only is he omniscient, he's omnipotent. He's all powerful. No, they don't want that. That somebody has absolute power over them? No. People want control. They want to be in control. Not just in control of themselves, they want to be in control of other people. They don't, when they catch you, when, they, when their clutches grab you, they don't want anybody to have the power to come and deliver you from their hands. So the fact that they hate you and they come after you and they grab you and then there is a God who is more powerful than they are that will deliver you from their hands, they don't like that. It's a stench of doom to them. They don't like that. For you that is being come, that is being come after, for you, you have a great deliverer. It's a fragrance of life to life. You have a great deliverer. Whenever the enemy comes after you and the enemies come after you, you run to God and say, you are the great deliverer. Deliver me with your mighty hand. You have delivered before. You will deliver again. For you, it's a fragrance of life to life. For them, no. It's a stench of doom, of death. Christmas not only represents eternal life, not only represents salvation, not only represents uh, El Olam, God of eternity, not only represents forgiveness, not only represents so many of the things that make the believers happy and joyful in God, Christmas time, once you say it is Christmas, you are talking about salvation. And when you talk about salvation, what you are saying by implication is that man is depraved and needs to be saved. They don't want to hear that. What people say and what people believe is that man is inherently good. But that is society and tradition and people make man bad. That man was born inherently good. And that is where, why you hear people say, you know, pastor, I, I know I'm not perfect, but I'm not a bad person. No, you are a very bad person. <laughs> you are a wicked person. You are a very heinous person. Because that's what people say. Pastor, I'm not, I, I, I know I, I, I'm not a very bad person. I know I'm not perfect. I do my own little good things here and there. No. You feel the rags before God. You are very bad. But people don't want to hear that. People want to hear that they are not bad. They do some bad things here and there, but they are not, generally speaking, they are not bad. They do some good things. They are not perfect, but they are not bad. No, 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 they are bad. We are bad. Tell yourself, I was bad before Jesus found me. 
Otherwise, you are a liar. You are bad. Even the things that you don't consider bad, in the eyes of God, they are bad. When you keep malice with people, in the eyes of God, it's bad. When you use some words that you should use, when you don't love enough, when you don't forgive, it's bad. I don't know whether we're going to finish this one today. Let me see. I have just about three minutes more. So, people don't want to be told that they are bad. And that is what Christmas does. Jesus came, the Bible said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son to come and rescue all of us. He came to rescue us because we, are, we can't even rescue ourselves. Everything we do is to destroy ourselves. Everybody, every country now wants to have nuclear power. Why? To wipe one another out. We, we are so bad. All the geniuses of this world, they have not been able to, 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 to stop this badness. In fact, they are making things worse. Internet, people are now committing suicide because of internet. Every solution we say we have found, it will create more problems. We are so bad. And that's why Christ came. Because he knows, God came from heaven, because he knows that we are not able to rescue ourselves from this situation. That he has to come and rescue us. And so for those of us who have received the what God has done to come and rescue us, the Christmas is for us a fragrance from life to life. We rejoice. We embrace it. We celebrate him and say, thank you. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for coming to rescue us. We know we're bad, but now you have cleaned us up. And now you have cleaned us up and you have cleansed us. And you have made us to be acceptable to the Father through you. Thank you, Jesus. And we are happy. We are exceedingly glad. And we celebrate Christmas. But for those who reject him, who say they don't like Christmas, who come after Christmas, I want to eliminate it, I want to remove it, and abolish it, and annul it, and negate it. For them, they say that they are not bad. I don't need anybody to save me. I don't need salvation. I am good. I'm good. I'm not that bad. And then Christmas represents, it's a reminder that you have a God that is making a righteous claim over your life. In other words, Christmas, Christ represents a God that demands holiness. A God that says that you have to repent. A God that says that you need repent and you need to understand that you cannot go on unforgiving. That you need to change from unforgiveness to forgiveness. You need to move from hating people to loving people. You need to move from being cruel to people to being kind and, and, and merciful to people. You have to repent. You have to change your ways. We have to turn from our wicked ways. That's what Chris, Christmas represents. And people don't want to hear that. People don't want to repent of their wicked ways. People want to continue living lascivious lives. They want to continue living in moral lawlessness. Like the sister of perpetual indulgence. They want to continue that lifestyle. They don't want me where Christmas represents repentance. And that is why they hate it with passion. It's a reminder that this God is a holy God. And he has come down here to let us know that he needs to be holy. We need to receive him. Now, for those of us who have received him and who celebrate Christmas, we are happy. We are saying, oh, thank you, Lord Jesus, for coming. Thank you for the Holy Spirit who is going to help me to live the kind of life that God wants me to live. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for giving me the power and the strength to live the kind of life that God wants. He said, because when I'm weak, then I am. I'm strong. Thank you, Lord Jesus, because I am the righteousness of God in you. And you begin to thank him. I begin to thank him. I say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can forgive. I can forgive. I can love this brother. I can love this sister. I can stop being nasty to people. I can do all things through 
Christ who strengthens me. We rejoice. We celebrate Krishna that Jesus has come. He has given me that power. He has enabled me to do that. I can run to him when I'm weak and say, Lord, help me. Help me. I want to forgive. It's so tough for me. Help me, Lord. And he will help. So we will rejoice when we hear Christmas. But those who don't want Christmas, who want to negate it and wipe it out, they don't want that. They don't want any God to make a righteous claim on their lives. They want him to leave them alone. They want to live their lives exactly the way they want to live it. They want moral lawlessness. They want lasciviousness. That's what Christmas represents, repentance. And people don't want to repent. Christmas represents eternity. Once you hear about Christmas, by implication, you must recognize eternity because one of the names of Jesus is El Olam, the God of eternity, the eternal God. And if there is eternity, by implication, it means there is afterlife. They hate that. They hate that they will scream. If it's afterlife, they scream, oh, no. You know why? Because by acknowledging that there is afterlife, it means you are also acknowledging that this is not the end of everything here, that you don't get away with anything. There is going to be judgment. Ah, judgment! No! Judgment! So when they see the nativity sin, they hate it with passion. Then they set up certain statue right beside it. Then the sisters of perpetual indulgence, they begin to perform sexual perversions right beside it. They want to negate it. They say, no, don't mention Christmas. Say happy holiday. Happy holiday. That's it. That's it. Make the bill. Be bill. No, we, you must work on Sunday. Cancel it. Cancel Christmas. Cancel Christ. Why? Because there is eternity. There is judgment. He's a, he's a reminder. He's reminding us that there is judgment coming. That we are not going to get away with this thing. All this blasphemy that we've been blaspheming him. He's reminding us that a day is coming when we are going to pay. Please put on the screen how hell, the illustration of hell that I give you. See, how they are going to be, they, 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 they remember this. That people are going to be thrown into this thing. And they hate it. They hate it. They don't want to be reminded of it. And that's why they attack Christmas. Eternity. And then, why do they hate Christmas? Or what does God really expect of us? Do we now say that because people hate Christmas, people don't want to have anything to do with it because they want to negate it. They want to cancel it. What is that? What is that supposed to now mean for you and I? Are we now to just be rejoicing and be happy all by ourselves and begin to condemn all these people who don't love Christmas, who want to uh, uh, destroy Christmas? Who, no, 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 at all. On the contrary, the Bible says that the God of this world has blinded men, the eyes of men, and blinded their minds and darkened their minds so that they would not be able to see and they would not be able to understand that Christmas is actually for them. That Christmas is what God has done to ensure that they have eternal life, that they have quality life, that they live forever and they live in his presence. That Christmas is there to remove their pain. That Christmas is there to give them peace that passes all understanding. But how will they know all these things if we don't tell them? That is why Christmas is about the great commission. God has commissioned you and I to spread the fragrance of his son and let people know about Christmas not just by celebrating it with paraphernalia and food and drinks but by the way we behave by showing the love of Christ to people by helping people by forgiving people by being kind to people and when people are wondering this brother this sister why is she like this and then people say oh no no he's a Christian she's a Christian She's a follower of Jesus. 
Oh, he is because he loves Jesus so much. That's why. That is a sweet smelling fragrance that you are spreading. Not that you don't feel hurt when they hurt you. Not that you don't feel um, you don't feel offended, but because you are a captive, you have been held captive by the love of God, by the mercy of God, by the grace of God, by the long suffering of God, by the gentleness of God. The Bible says that his gentleness has made me great. The gentleness of God has made you great. Let your gentleness make others great. Glory be to his holy name. Hallelujah. Let's bow down our heads in prayer. If you are listening to me today, and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, there are two things we are going to do. You are going to give your life to Jesus today, and we are going to eat the Holy Communion together. So if you know you have not received him, this is your moment to receive him. The Bible says it is appointed unto man who wants to die, and then judgment. There is going to be a time of judgment. That's what Christmas is all about. But Christmas is all about forgiveness so that you are not judged. That's why Christ came. So that you will not suffer eternal damnation. So if you know you are in the house today and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, wave your hand wherever you are right now. You know you've never received him. Just wave that hand wherever you are and you will receive him right now and your name will be written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Is there anybody in the house who has not received Jesus, who does not know Jesus as Lord and Savior? A moment. This is your moment. Is there anybody? Wave your hand. You have not received Jesus as your Lord and Savior. This is your moment to receive him. Those who are watching us online, if you have not received Jesus, wave your hand to heaven. Heaven will see you. Jesus will see you. Jesus will see you. The Bible says, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Except he's born of the water and of the spirit of God, he cannot enter into it. Are you born again? Have you received Jesus? Born again is not a slogan. It's not something that is a slogan that that they are just throwing around. No, Jesus himself is the one who said it. That you have to be born again. You have to be born by the Holy Spirit. Is there anybody here who wants to be born by the Holy Spirit? You want to be born again? Wave that hand. And let me see it. Your life will never be the same again. If you are hearing me right there in your home, you want to be born again, wave your hand to the Lord. The rest of us, let's begin to talk to the Father about members of our families who do not know Jesus. If you have anyone in your family, your spouse, your, br- your brother, your sister, your siblings, you have anyone, your father, your mom, they don't know Jesus. You know they are very religious, they go to church, they do church things, but deep down you know that they have no relationship with Jesus Christ. This is your moment. Pray for them. Let's believe God together for them that they will come to the saving knowledge of Jesus. Is there? Begin to pray.